So what is Azure File Sync really? What's really going on under the hood and what does it look like to deploy it? What is going to be our game plan? That's what this video is all about. We're going to talk about what's the point of Azure File Sync, how does it really work, and then how do you attack this in little bits and pieces. It's kind of going to be like a little checklist. Now don't worry. Azure File Sync itself as a deployment is not nearly as bad as other types of deployments or hybrid style deployments that you've done in the past. This is something that's relatively easy to do, but nonetheless, there's still a, a set set of steps that you need to go through and a set bit of requirements that you need to have up front. So in this video, what we're going to do is talk about what is the attack plan? What are the, the curveballs that could get thrown our way? And then in the next set of videos, we're going to get started actually deploying it. Let's go. So over the years, Windows came up with a few different technologies that were designed to ease the process of multiple offices collaborating on a file share. And there were some redundancy benefits to this, but really the idea here was collaboration. Pretend for a second we had our gigantic HQ building. Maybe we're a large nationwide bank or something like that. We've got, you know, our, our headquarter is in North Carolina or New York City, where most banks are headquartered these days, it seems. Then we have regional offices. Maybe they're in like Texas and, you know, make up something in Louisiana, where I am, and Florida, because this bank is primarily focused on, you know, servicing the Gulf Coast and the Southeastern. So what happens here is in our HQ, you know, we have one big file share. But these are our regional offices. They're not necessarily branches for the bank. They're just regional administrative offices. And a lot of collaboration has to take place between our HQ and our regional offices. So we set up servers here and servers here and servers here. And then using technologies like branch cache or DFS, we were able to set up a form of replication that existed between all of these servers going back and forth. So as one file was accessed, say in Louisiana, that file would have been copied from the HQ file share to the Louisiana file share. That's kind of the idea between, between branch cache. Or using DFS with namespaces and replication, uh, the files would all be replicated from one file share to the next. And anytime one file was changed, it would automatically be replicated to all of the other file shares in the namespace. These were fantastic technologies because uh, first of all, it gave us just a level of resiliency and redundancy, right? If one file share were to go down, users could still maintain access to the file share using something like DFS namespaces. They would just be redirected to the nearest file share at that point, which was a huge, huge benefit for all of us. Uh, but then, you know, it comes to, to the point that we're still, we as administrators, have control over all of the hardware, all of the assets, and all of the replication and technologies that are happening here, which to a degree is a very good thing too. We like to know, you know that we are in control of the situation. That's just human nature. And uh, this is kind of the idea with DFS and, and branch cache and whatever on the table. But the thing is, is with that control comes the added responsibility, right? That's that's kind of the idea there. So what, what the cloud providers did is imagine if I just erased all of these links and dead smack in the center, we put the cloud. In this case, I'm going to put Azure. And now our file share replication services look something kind of like this. Isn't that kind of interesting, right? And with this, you start thinking about all of the benefits of using the cloud as a centralized provider. It's going to be SLAs, it's going to be redundancy, it's going to be high availability, and it's going to be, very importantly, mobility. I think that's a big one to keep in mind is because as we stand up new branches into our environment, we could effectively just kind of point them at the cloud and guess what? Next thing we know, we have all of the technologies that are in play here. Now, the interesting thing about Azure File Sync itself is that it really works more like branch cache. So typically when you deploy Azure File Sync, now this isn't necessary, this isn't 100% the way you do it, but typically the way it works is if I have client computers in my office here, uh, ideally what we would have happen is we would point them maybe to our local file share here to access files. And if our file share doesn't have access to the files by default, it goes out and it gets them. Then it caches them locally on the file share. So the cloud would have basically all of the files, you know, synced to it by default and it holds all of the files. And then the file share 
over time can determine which ones it wants to cache. Believe it or not, they actually have a term for that and it's called cloud tiering. This is a thing that you can configure. It's not necessarily a thing that you have to configure, but in Azure File Sync, I'm gonna point out where you can. It's called cloud tiering. And what we're saying here is when we have data that is hot, meaning it gets accessed pretty frequently, that's what we're gonna store on our local servers. They're gonna keep track of the files that they're accessing regularly, and they're gonna be the primary access point for the data, and Azure will serve as the backup cache in the event that the file share goes down. The flip side of that is also true. If we have data that is cold, data that's not frequently accessed all the time, we'll put that in the Azure cloud and the file share itself will free up that space and it will only get the file whenever it actually needs it. This is great for stuff that's, you know, more or less for archiving. And, and the cool thing about Azure File Sync when you enable this is it kind of just handles it all for you. You can specify parameters if you want, but it's very intelligent on its own and it can handle that for us, which is really neat. Now you may be also thinking to yourself, okay, well, this is gonna behave a lot like branch cache. What if I have DFS uh, namespaces and replication already up in my environment? Works just the same, works the exact same. You can point a DFS namespace or a DFS participating server to Azure File Sync and it will still be able to replicate data back and forth between the Azure Cloud and all of your file share server. So this is going to be an added benefit to having just inserting the cloud in the mix. It's almost like a backup of your file share. It's almost like a high availability solution for your file share, but instead it's a hybrid of everything, isn't it? We still have our on-premise file share, but we've also added a cloud-based version of our file share to realize all of the benefits that coming with the cloud. So that's pretty cool. Now, how do we go about deploying it? Is it a hard thing to deploy? Not particularly. Let's clear the screen here for a second. When we go to deploy Azure File Sync, the first thing we're gonna need is Azure Storage. And specifically, we need this to be file storage. Why? Because we're dealing with a file share at the end of the day when we need to retain our NTFS permissions. This is what the storage account with file storage selection is really what's available to us. So we're not going to use things like blob storage or queue storage or table storage. This is specifically for Azure file storage. So step one is really going to be to deploy Azure file storage with Azure storage account with file storage. But there's one more thing we have to deploy, and this is a relatively basic deployment, at least for step one. And we actually have to deploy an Azure file sync resource. This is where we're actually gonna tell it, hey, you're gonna be syncing a file share, uh, and here's the configuration steps that we wanna do. So that's the deployment for the Azure resources. They need to have a landing zone uh, for every for all of the files and configurations to land. The configuration for file sync itself is actually done all from Azure. It communicates from the Azure cloud down to all of your servers by pushing commands and configurations down to the servers via an agent. There's a little installer that we're gonna run uh, that's gonna handle that. But before you can run that installer, you gotta make sure your environment is ready for the installer, and that's gonna be a basic assessment. Now, really what this means is two things. The first thing, uh, I'm gonna put A here. You need to have the correct .NET framework already installed. This is uh, typically something greater than .NET Framework 4.7, but .NET changes quite a bit. We went through a phase where there was .NET Core, and now there's just .NET 5. So uh, you'll wanna check to make sure that the version that you're about to install or the Azure File Sync deployment that you're about to do does have the latest version of .NET that is required by that. Now, what does .NET really do for an infrastructure under the hood? Basically, when Microsoft comes out with new things, the .NET framework tells the computer, how do I communicate to these new things? So when you create Azure File Sync or they update Azure File Sync, there's gonna be new commands that your computer has to learn. That's what the .NET framework brings to the table. Now, you as a developer, uh, you don't actually develop in the .NET framework. These are just the commands that the computer needs to know and understand how the objects work. What you do in uh, the development world though, is you use one of two programming languages that instruct the computer how to interact with the .NET framework. One of those is PowerShell. So when we actually start to deploy Azure File Sync, what it's really doing under the hood is just running PowerShell commandlets. 
And those PowerShell commandlets are what send the commands down to the .NET framework. So uh, what we need to do in our assessment was we need to have make sure that we are able to install the latest version of .NET framework that we need for Azure File Sync, and we need to have the correct PowerShell module, basically the package of PowerShell commands installed so that when it's time to install Azure File Sync, it's already got all the commandlets that it needs installed, and it's already got the .NET framework installed in it. So this is our assessment step that we're gonna do in step two. In step three, it's time to install the agent. There's really not much more to it than that. We download uh, the agent, we run the installer, maybe it throws a curveball at us, we're gonna find out. We're gonna make sure that everything works the way we expect it to. And then in step four, the final step, we jump back to Azure and we actually configure Azure File Sync. We tell it how it should actually be doing the syncing process. What directory should it be syncing and between what servers and so on. So these are the steps to deploy. There's really only four steps, but these four steps, they have some nuances to each of them and that's why they're each gonna get their own video in the upcoming steps. So now we understand what Azure File Sync is and why we need it, it's time to start deploying it. In the next video, we're gonna jump into the portal and get our landing zones for step one, the Azure Storage Account, as well as Azure File Sync resource already deployed. Let's go. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.